Why did SpaceX's Starship 7 explode? And what has been done to rectify the situation? Let's get into it. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much once again joining me for Tea Time. Today we have a little bit of Fireside. I hope you're joining me with your cup of tea, maybe a cup of coffee, hanging out, talking tech, talking photo, talking video, talking space. Today is a spacey day. We're going to be talking about Elon Musk's SpaceX Starship, Starship 7. Why did it explode? That is the question. And there was an official release. The investigation was concluded and now they gave their findings. Now, I want to go through this with you and then I want to propose something slightly different that they didn't say here, that once again, I'm not a rocket scientist, but it just seems plausible and I wanna know what you think about my theory. So before we get into this official brief, let's call it, I wanna say that if you enjoy the content, throw it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. If you're not, if you are, I appreciate that. Thank you. Click this little notification button here so I go live when a new video comes out, you'll be notified of it immediately. And I'll be live on Friday covering Starship 8, IFT-8. This should be a good one. A lot of new things on board, structural changes, a lot of changes. And we wanna see if it works or once again, if it ends up in a rud. Let's hope not. Also, if you just wanna say thank you for all of my hard work, there's a little thank you button, click on that, give a dollar or two if you like. If not, it's perfectly fine. The video is still free. Consider becoming a member of the channel. That would be even better. And if you want SpaceX Starlink specific content, I've put together about 430 videos just for you. Helpful how-tos, tips, tricks, what to do, what not to do, what to buy, what not to buy, and of course the why behind all of it because this channel has always been about the why and will continue to be about the why because I think the why is more important than the how. The how is important, but the why is really important. <laughs> Finally, if you haven't downloaded any of my ebooks, check them out. Go to jchristina.com forward slash books. Once again, jchristina.com forward slash books. So let's jump right into this official debrief, let's call it. Following an ambitious seventh flight test liftoff from Starbase on January 16th, 2025, SpaceX has completed its investigation into the Starship anomaly that occurred during the mission. SpaceX led the investigation with oversight from the Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA, and participation with NASA, the National Transportation Safety Board, and the U.S. Space Force. The launch proceeded nominally through liftoff, booster separation, and the Super Heavy booster return and successful catch at the launch tower approximately seven minutes into the flight. Following stage separation, Starship 6 Raptor engines ignited for its ascent burn. Approximately two minutes into the burn, flight data showed a flash near one of the Raptor vacuum engines, along with a detected pressure rise in the aft section, suggesting a propellant leak. Roughly two minutes later, a second flash occurred followed by sustained fire in the aft section of the ship. The fires eventually caused five of the Starship's six engines to execute controlled shutdown sequences and telemetry was lost with the vehicle after approximately eight and a half minutes of flight prior to triggering any destruct rules for its autonomous flight safety system or its AFSS. While the AFSS remained fully healthy at the time communication was lost, the vehicle was observed breaking apart approximately 30 seconds later over the Atlantic Ocean near the Turks and Caicos Islands. The most probable root cause for the loss of the ship was identified as a harmonic response, several times stronger in flight than had been seen during testing, which led to increased stress on hardware in the propulsion system. The subsequent propellant leak exceeded the venting capability of the ship's attic area and resulted in sustained fires. The attic is an unpressurized volume in the aft section of the ship between the base of the liquid oxygen tank and the top of the heat shield. Before I go any further, I know there's going to be some of you guys out there being like, Joe, what the heck is the aft? What is the attic? And you kind of need to know the terminology. If not, you don't know what's going on here. So the aft of the craft, the aft of the craft, yeah, is the back end. Or if it was a, a car, it would be the trunk. All right, that's the aft. Where the engines are. I guess if you were a Porsche. Anyways, 
I digress. The attic is a portion or an area between the LOX tank, the liquid oxygen tank, and the shield, the heat shield, that separates the engines from that liquid cooled oxygen. You definitely don't want them to mix or you end up with boom, right? So that's this empty area. And that area is unpressurized. It's just an area. You can't like hold cargo in it or something. We can't just like sit in it. Anyways, let's jump back into this brief. Post-flight analysis indicates that the safety system did trigger autonomously and breakup occurred within flight termination system expectations. So it did what it's supposed to do and went boom accordingly. And it did it autonomously because remember, there was no more communication. Telemetry was out. That's a good thing. It worked. To better understand the anomaly, SpaceX performed an extended static fire test for Starship's vehicle built for Flight 8, igniting all six engines for approximately 60 seconds on February 12th, and incorporated flight data from Flight 7 to further investigate the failure. The results of that extra long firing informed hardware changes to the vacuum engines, fuel feed lines, adjustments to propellant temperatures, and a new operating thrust target that will be used on up and coming flight tests. To address flammability potential in the attic, now we know what the attic is, section on the Starship, additional vents and a new purge system utilizing gaseous nitrogen are being added to the current generation of Starship to make make the area more robust to propellant leaks. Future upgrades to the Starship will introduce the Raptor 3 engines, reducing the attic volume, reducing the attic volume, and eliminating the majority of joints that can leak into this volume. Starship's seventh flight test didn't reach its ambitious objectives that included deployment of a payload of Starlink satellite simulators and a splashdown in the Indian Ocean, but provided valuable data that continues to accelerate the vehicle's development. Already, hardware for Starship's eighth flight test is built and ongoing pre-launch testing at Starbase in preparation for a launch targeted as soon as February 28th pending regulatory approval. So the 28th will be Friday. So most likely will happen on Friday. They're usually on time, kind of, sort of. I think they're going to be on time on this one. So on Friday, be here. The easiest way of knowing when I go live is clicking that notification button over there. So it will notify you just before it happens, usually about an hour, hour and a half before. It'll say, hey, JC Live is going to be happening. Join me. I would really appreciate you being here. So now they gave us all of this information. I had a little bit of a theory. And before I go into the theory, I want to kind of go into an explanation of what they're talking about here with harmonic response and all this kind of stuff. I already told you what the attic was and what the aft is and all the rest. Now, what is this harmonic response? What exactly is that? Basically, you can think of a harmonic response as if you pluck a string on a guitar, right? You can see it vibrate. Now, for me, I have more of a, let's say, firsthand experience with harmonic response. I used to be a stunt rider. I used to ride an R1. Matter of fact, maybe I'll put a picture here, there, or elsewhere. I used to do wheelies and endos and shows and do all this kind of stuff. We would practice all the guys that were on the team together on Fridays as well as Sundays. That's what we would do. So I used to ride all the time. Now on the front of the motorcycle, there was a thing called a dampener. And what it would do is it would stop harmonic response. So if you're up in a wheelie and you're going really fast and you put that front wheel down. If you put it down just slightly cockeyed, you'll get this wheel shake. It'll start out as a small shake and then it'll get more and more and more violent until you get kicked off the motorcycle. That's a harmonic response. And that's basically what was going on. It started out with a small shake. It turned into a violent shake. That violent shake caused cracking and lines probably bursting and a lot of other problems. Once again, harmonic response. So why was it stronger in the flight in comparison to when they tested it on the ground? A lot of people will ask this question. And 
Basically, the reason being is there are things that are different. When you have it bolted down on the ground, well, you don't have air pressure, you don't have changes of fuel and where it lies in the tanks and changes of the structure because the structure is expanding and contracting with the temperature changes. You have shifting weights as the fuel is being dispersed and used. There's a lot of things, rushing air. So there's a lot of factors that you cannot look at when something is bolted to the ground. So stress on the propulsion system is what ended up causing this whole thing to happen. There was leaks and then the leaks turned into a fire and then a secondary fire and then finally a fire that wouldn't go out. The engines ended up shutting off like they supposed to do and then finally, boom. Now, the leak happened in the attic, right? And we already figured out that the attic was that portion between the LOX tank, that liquid oxygen tank, and the engines. And of course, you have that heat shield, let's say, or that heap thick, thick piece of metal. I say thick, but I found out it really wasn't thick. It's like eight millimeters or something. It's not that thick, but it, let's call it a thick piece of metal in between the LOX tank and the fiery engines. We don't want to mix fire with the LOX tank because what do you get? Boom. So when I was thinking about this, and if you remember on IFT7, we talked about it. I said, you know, they're going to be introducing 25% more propellant on this next flight. Now that's all good and all, but now how do you do that? How do you get 25%, that's a lot, more propellant on the craft? Well, there's really two ways. Number one, you could super cool it even colder than it already is to make it more dense so that you could add more to it. Or you can make the LOX tank bigger. I propose that they made the LOX tank bigger. And the reason why I think that they made the LOX tank bigger is because the actual craft was like 1.8 meters, let's call it about six feet taller. Why did they make it taller? The LOX tank. That's my personal opinion. They did not say that. Matter of fact, they didn't even say that they added 25%. They didn't officially say that they added 25% more. So what I'm saying now could be just pie in the sky. It might not be right at all, but I feel that they did. Because once again, why would they make the craft 1.8 meters taller? Unless they needed more room for something. What was that something? I propose that it's locks. Now, that all being said, why does that matter? In my personal opinion, when you made the craft longer, okay, and now we have that extra space once again there, the structure changes. And when a structure changes, you don't know how it's going to interact or act with once again, atmospheric conditions, cooling, heating, and all the rest of the stuff. Pressure changes, like we said before. And you have 25 more percent of fuel in there that is going to be chugging around moving around and causing these type of anomalies. Harmonic response. That's my personal opinion. That's what I think happened. Now, they don't state that and I could be wrong. Now remember, take everything that I'm saying with a grain of salt, because I'm not a rocket scientist, right? I wanna know what you think. Could I be right, wrong? I don't know. Down below, let me know. The reason I say this is because there was something that they said in this brief that kind of points to it for me. It stated this, it said future upgrades to Starship will introduce the Raptor 3 engines, reducing the attic volume and eliminating the majority of joints that can leak into this volume. Reducing the attic volume. So by them stating that means to me the attic volume was a liability. Right? Why would they state that? Why do they need to reduce that attic volume? That space between the locks and the fiery engines. Why would you want to reduce that space? I propose that just as they said, they were adding venting and a new purge system to that attic region. A new purge system was using that gaseous nitrogen to purge out. So you don't need this volume. Once again, it's not for cargo. If we can't sit in it, right? It's a waste of space. So by reducing that, maybe they could once again reduce 
the size of the ship, number one, and also now let's say strengthen the ship based on the added locks that's being carried. 25% more propellant. That has some serious weight to it. Not a little bit, a lot of it. So that's my personal opinion. That's what I think happened. I think it's fantastic that they're adding this new venting system, the new nitrous purging deal, and shrinking that area and all the rest of the stuff that they're going to be doing with those Raptor 3s that will be coming in the next iteration. So we'll know by Friday, most likely by Friday, how will it turn out? Will it run? Rapid unscheduled disassembly or will it not? I hope not. And the reason being is I want to see that Pez dispenser launch out those Starlink duds. That'll be awesome. That will mean that if that works properly, the SpaceX Starlink version three satellites are right around the corner. Now, obviously we're not there yet, but that's going to take us one step closer. Also, remember, there's a lot of other changes that I've talked to you guys about in a past video that were done on IFT7 that weren't able to be tested. One of them was that metallic covering that on the heat shielding. So instead of being a passive heat shield, it is more of an actively cooled heat shield where the cooling is coming into the bottom of the heat shielding and cooling it almost like what we have on our water cooled CPUs on our computers. Same type of principle. So there's a lot of things that were on IFT7 that were never able to be tested. So we'll see what ends up happening. I'm excited. Are you guys excited? Once again, what do you think about my theory? Does it hold water? Does it hold propellant <laughs> or does it not? Let me know down below. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this content. If you did, throw it a thumbs up. I'd really appreciate that. And share the channel. Share the video with your friends, family, colleagues. Share it with everyone so we can grow this channel. I would really appreciate your help. Finally, head over to my website, jchristina.com, where you can find all the photography tools and my merch and my tees and my books and my shirts and everything else. Check them out. Go to jchristina.com, see if there's something there that you like. And if there is, please pick it up. Help support me and my family. Many blessings to you and your family. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay connected, and we'll see you for IFT8. Take care, guys. Love you all. Bye.